Okay, thanks. Do we have any other questions or comments? Great, we've got one at the front. Yeah, I'd like to begin, if I may, with a question to Richard, because I was a little unclear about what the actual scientific contribution of the participants in Folded were being asked to make and the originality of that, that uh, contribution. Sort of leading from that, though, I'm, I'm tempted to also raise a couple of other questions of the panel uh, about what happens if I start to put a preposition into making science public. Uh, and the first one is uh, the thought of uh, making science by the public. And I guess this is inspired a little bit by what Richard was talking about. But going even further, I'd be interested in the panel's uh, views on things like the garage biology movement, of actually citizens outside of the scientific establishment doing the science for themselves. And related to that, in fact, also the other preposition, making science in public. Uh, there was recently a report in Nature, uh, to which Jerry Rivets, Peter Healy, and I responded a little bit with a short letter, calling attention to uh, the proposals by a group of scientists to perform rat feeding experiments with genetically modified foods with a 24-hour um, video uh, live feed of this onto the web. So it's a sort of, if you like, sort of big brother science almost. Uh, uh, and the, so the whole thing was going to be visible in real time, not an edited, recorded program about it. Um, when questioned about actually how they would fund such a thing, they even went further and said, well, we could do this by crowdsourcing. And of course, as you know from looking at the web a little bit, there's actually quite a lot of crowdsourcing the scientific funding going on in the web as well. So I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts about pushing a little bit further from just making science public to making science by the public and making science in public. Okay. Thank you. Do I have volunteers who'd like to start or we can... <laughs> <laughs> okay, where do you start? Right, um, okay, scientific contribution. So um, just to give you a... Uh, I would, I would think of it in two ways. I would think of it as scientific contribution, actually more generally research contribution, because they're, they're, they're published in two areas at least that I know of. One of which is around uh, solving these protein structures, uh, particularly around HIV, so you can actually develop better um, drugs to de deal with that. So they published in Nature as a result of that. Um, one of the interesting things for me that that uh, raises and, and the whole citizen science area raises um, is then how do you attribute the contributions of the people who have worked in that uh, way. So they tend to be uh, listed as folded contributors on the paper as well as the scientists that are getting their names up there. So there's a kind of issue about uh, attribution, I think, to these kind of um, developments. The, the other area that they've definitely published in is around actually just the development of technologies. So there's kind of two research lines that come out of it. So there's two, two contributions to knowledge, if you like. Uh, crowdfunding, crikey. Um, <laughs> I've seen it done occasionally, yeah. It's an interesting idea. I think it does change the nature of the relationship. I mean, at the moment, obviously, people tend to give their time voluntarily um, to these projects, and that, that kind of changes that nature, uh, nature of that relationship. I suppose uh, an example which I know of um, which the OU is involved with to some extent is, is not online, but it's still a citizen science initiative, which is Earthwatch, where essentially you get people to buy small amounts of projects, if you like, but they go on the project expedition. So you, as, a, as a scientist, you say, OK, this is my research problem. I want to go to forest in some tropical country to study trees or whatever. Um, you put together a plan and you cost it, and you say, OK, if I tw take 20 people with me, it'll cost them each £5,000. That's their trip, plus everything else I need to fund the trip and do the research myself. And they've been running for a good number of years now, and they have a huge number of projects running in that way. So that kind of model already exists, and it, it kind of works. Um, yeah, I suppose I was thinking that um, this idea of, I, I've not read the piece that you're talking about, the kind of uh, doing an experiment in, in public or filming it in a sense that it, it's visible. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it sort of puts a different spin on this idea of show you're working, which um, Mike, uh, Hugh, uh, and Jerry Rabbits have written about. Um, but I suppose what would be interesting there is, I mean, was there any discussion uh, 
uh, that uh, the way in which this data, uh, this experimental data is interpreted by scientists involved, um, would that be made public? Those kind of internal discussions, I guess, that could be interesting if that's part of what is made visible. Um, so if, for example, there are different ways in which, if there's some uh, conflicts or different ways in which um, we are supposed to interpret what's happening in that experiment, um, and if that's actually not just part of what takes place in closed doors or in journal articles or whatever, but is actually yeah, part of this uh, exercise in publicity, yeah, that could be interesting. But I don't know if that was part of what they were talking about. I'm happy to talk about this. Okay, thanks, Brady. As, as a journalist, I'm very interested in science being done in public. I'm very aware of how peer review works, and I'm aware of the arguments for it. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have it, but I'm not going to talk about it because it's not as interesting to me. In terms of doing science in public, I think it should happen, and I think it's in the best interests of science. I think people who try and engage the public with science feel frustrated, and they lament that people aren't interested in science. But why do people watch football, so much football? What, all they care about is football. Why, why aren't they more interested in science? I think we should look at the football model. With football, they don't just publish the results in the newspaper every week, and you go through the results and go, that's who won, and that's who lost. Excellent, now I know. <laughs> People are engaged with football because they live it, and they understand what went into those results at the end. They, were, they watched the moment that Wayne Rooney missed the penalty and fell down with his head in his hands. They saw the match. They lived through the nil-nil draw, the drudgery of that that winter's day when they sat in the stadium and had a terrible day, but they knew it was leading to something bigger. Maybe it would lead to a trophy at the end of the season. People engage with things that they understand and that they've seen. They don't engage with one paper every year or two and a press release. I think if people know what went into that paper and that press release and the doors are opened a bit more and they see the ups and the downs and what you do, even when it's boring, and when it's exciting, and all the emotion of it, and the humanity of it, because it's humans who do science still, I think when you allow people to see that, people become more engaged and more interested, and I think that has a lot of benefits. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Do you want to come back? Yeah. Yeah, to two, two points on the openness thing. O openness is fascinating as a, as a kind of concept and how it works in practice. So I, the question I suppose I would ask everybody else in the room is, okay, why just science? Yeah? Why not open social science? Why not open humanities? Okay, so if we're going to do it, why just science? Um, and then it comes to an issue of, it's like Sir Giles saying, okay, what do you publish? Okay, what is open? Do you stop ClimateGate by everybody publishing their email trails <laughs> after the fact? Yeah? And what would that do to the way we communicate with each other? But that's kind of where you're going to in that. Do you know what I mean, where, where do you stop? Do you know what I mean? There's a place of saying, okay, do we just have open data? Do you have open notebooks? You know, where do we stop? You know, so there's, there's a really interesting issue about what we actually make public and when we make public, which I think is yet to be kind of thought through, particularly around the kind of open access debate and then how that relates to open data. It's a really fascinating set of issues. And then how, how does that relate to the way journalists use that data? How does that weight relate to the way that advocates use that, change, that, that, that data, that information. So I don't think you'll get rid of things like climate gate, they'll just change, because people care passionately about these things. Okay, thank you. We've got a few questions queuing up. So do you want to have a quick... Oh, just a, a quick response there. I, I suppose, yeah, I think part of that is also the question of what is made public? Uh, so if it's opening up a database or whatever, even notebooks, you know, what then happens to... Uh, the data that, the, the way in which the notebook might be written um, if you think you had to make it public in this kind of way and yeah, what gets redacted and otherwise and you know, so those kinds of questions would come into it I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Great, thanks. This is getting really interesting and linking I think with some of the themes we were talking about this morning. So we've got a question at the front and then one right at the back. So we'll start with uh, yeah, Mike Hume, University of Sangley. So just picking up on that last little exchange, uh, and being inspired by so to ask this question, what is it that's been uh, opened up or made public? So, uh, I mentioned the climate gate story. One of the criticisms that came through the reviews was particularly focused on data uh, and restrictions about data. 
Um, but I'm also interested, though, in the way in which a number of the um, science studies uh, papers and analyses now of climate gate that have emerged are focused on the practices of climate scientists. And actually, the majority of the scholarship is saying, well, there's nothing particularly exceptional or unusual about these practices of the climate scientists, because that's what, climate, that's what scientists do. Uh, and the problem was that people got heat hot on the collar because they didn't think that's what scientists did. So my question really then is about opening up to norms and practices and ethics, uh, either tacit or not so tacit, that exist within science, and whether there is any value in opening up those to wider public um, understanding, but actually, uh, 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 and maybe we can get the analogy of the football, which is quite a nice analogy here. It, it, yes, we, we like watching the football match, but, but as, as, as a paying member of the, of the public, I, I want to have some confidence in the integrity of the referee, who is doing the regulation, what are the rules, what are the norms and practices that, that govern the players, both tacitly, but also explicitly. So my question is about opening up that dimension of science and whether there's actually public value in opening up that dimension of science. You also would watch Premier League, not schoolboy league. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK, there's a few more questions, but yeah, we'll just give the panel the opportunity to respond. OK. Um, yeah, thanks. thanks for that question. Um, I think... One of the things that, that I find quite important is to, uh, to hold maybe two uh, contradictory things alive in this kind of openness debate. On the one hand, you can't just say, uh, oh, we can't have openness or we can't have transparency or you know, any of those things uh, because it wouldn't work or it is uh, unnecessary or people would get agitated or you know, those, because there's sometimes very kind of instrumental arguments given, um, if, if you like, against openness. And I think you can't do that. I think, Openness of publicity as a value has a sort of central kind of democratic imperative behind it. But how that then gets taken up in practice, so what impact that would actually have and how things are opened up, I think that's a separate matter and that still needs to be, um, I guess one needs to be kind of vigilant about uh, what actually then happens, what, what's expected to happen uh, if you open up a database. Does that mean that people are then going to just because you get two opposing things. One is the concern that if people saw these conflicts, uh, that they would, like as you said, you know, they don't expect this, they're going to reject the science or whatever. But on the other hand, there's also this expectation that if you open things up, um, that will create acceptance, or public acceptance. I mean, going back to some of the things Ulrika was talking about this morning. So I think what's, uh, what I find important is to kind of um, keep both of those. So on the one hand, openness as a, as a general norm, a public value, you know, those things are really important, but how do they actually play out in practice? I think um, we need to kind of be, um, kind of, yeah, vigilant about that. Um, yeah, I mean, just to pick up on that kind of what, what a scientist do, what many of us do as researchers. I think, as Sir Joseph already said, I think we would change the practice of the way people work if we make everything public in terms of digital streams of data, with that information communication. I mean, I work in a science faculty and I actually scientists work every day and they do a lot of, an awful lot of good work at coffee. Yeah. Coffee break is important. Everybody needs a coffee, it's just a number in group. I think you do an awful, awful lot more work over coffee if you make everything available digitally because they'll stop communicating in that way. This is one thing. And the other thing I think which has come up, uh, I have a difficult role at the Open University since Peter asked me to come onto this project which is much more about uh, you know, how we engage across our whole research portfolio. And one of the issues and concerns that's come up is, is around the kind of overhead for how we, you know, how we actually cost this stuff up. Who pays for the kind of curation and storage of all this information that we're going to keep online publicly? Um, who makes sure that the stuff isn't used inappropriately? I mean, those are, those are skills that need to be done. They're, they're, they're roles that need to be paid for. People are getting worried about that, to be honest. You know, in a never shrinking research budget. It's a kind of practical perspective, but we are talking about practical research, aren't we? Radio Samantha, do you want to chip? I, I could talk about this all day, but I think we should probably let other people have some right. questions. Thank <laughs> you. So there's a question right at the back. 
Hi, Dave Gustin, Arizona State. Um, following on to the football analogy again, um, one of the, the challenges that that analogy brings forward is, as I think the panel followed up on a little bit, um, the changing quality of science as it moves into this sort of, if you will, performance mode. And one of the important points, of course, about the, the football analogy is, well, you've got, you know, you've got City and you've got United. And you emphasize the particular and the partisan when something moves into that, performa into, into that performative mode. And so that's something, of course, that, that scientists tend to be rather hesitant to do. Um, but lots of uh, scholarship has, in fact, called for a more uh, attached partisan-oriented science as well, then one could also argue that, at least in the American context, where we have very strong constitutional protections for the kinds of speech acts and performances that support democratic politics, uh, that science might, in fact, be more protected if it looked more like performance art than if we're simply a commercial activity in a university, a commercially related activity in, universal, in a university laboratory. Um, the second thing that the analogy leads me to think about, um, not unrelated to Steve's comment, that uh, addendum to Mike's comment that um, you know, it's, it's the first edition that you're watching and not the school children, but um, it's also the performance that you're watching, not the practice that you're watching. And this sort of has this, you know, Latourian turn to it, that you're watching uh, the football that's made, not the football in the making. Uh, and going back to the point about transparency, um, you know, there's a, a certain kind of protected space that all sorts of activities in society have in order to help them uh, perfect their activity for public consumption. Go. People have taken this football analogy very far. <laughs> but there's a few things about it that I would probably think differently. First of all, this competition thing, this United versus City, I think in this analogy, which is getting really carried away here now, it's not scientist versus scientist. It's not United versus City. The thing people are watching is scientist versus the problem that the scientist is trying to solve. That's the game we're watching. We're not watching his video versus his video to see who did a better job of explaining their work. The games we're watching in this analogy is scientist versus nature, scientists working with nature, however you want to look at it. Coming to a few other things about the analogy. <laughs> the lower league thing, I'd never thought about that before. The reason people play schoolboy football is because they like watching Premiership football. So I don't think there's anything wrong with making good videos about science and saying it belittles or it ruins schoolboy football any more than saying a good... I, don't, I also don't think it works to say a really good science video ruins it for the person who's not doing such... who's doing science that's not on TV. People, do, people I think if we make Premier League football science videos, more people will play schoolboy science and maybe some of those will one day play Premiership football too. So I think there's no harm in people wanting to watch good science videos. I don't think it ruins it for the people who aren't in the videos. There are a few other things you said in that very well argued question that I wanted to address, and I can't remember what you said. Can you remind me, can you remind me of a couple of other things you said? Um. Practice? Performance? Oh yes, the performance. That was the other thing. The performance. I don't think a game of football, you may think a game of football is a performance, but the footballers would probably argue for them it's practice. It's watching, it's watching them <coughs> perform their skill. And just because it's entertaining doesn't mean it's not them doing their craft. And likewise with scientists, just because they're doing their craft doesn't mean it can't be entertaining or interesting or informative. So I don't think there's anything wrong with watching scientists perform their craft like we watch footballers perform their craft. And I think if we had more of it and saw just how skillful and good they were at their craft, more people may watch the game. Can I make one more analogy? 
because this football analogy is going to keep is going to keep coming back. Can I, Brady? Really sorry. I'm sure it'll be a great analogy. Can I? I'm just really conscious of time. I said I'd be quite a harsh chair. Oh, and you um, took it out on me. We've um, got about two minutes left, and I've, I've oh. got so far a queue of two questions. So can I take those two questions in turn? Um, are there any more questions anyone was burning with? Okay, so I'm up to three. If we could take those questions first, and then. Um, maybe give the panel an opportunity to respond. So the first question, if you still wanted to ask it, yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, I'm a practicing scientist, I'm a physicist. So it was interesting the argument that was made about climate gear that this was somehow prevalent and this, these were the working mes methods of, of scientists right across the board. For many of us, what happened with climate gear, particularly the idea that you protect data through, you know, the Data Protection Act, was absolute anathema. It's, you know, I, I know that the plural of you know, anecdote is not evidence, but I think, you know, speaking with my colleagues, many of us were shocked by what happened with climate gear. So maybe we can talk later about, you know, your evidence source for that. Um, and when you go to the journals, if you actually go to the journals and you look at the journal guidelines, they stipulate that authors should provide to interested parties on a timely basis the raw data, the archives, everything associated with the publication. That's already there. Okay, it's only in inverted commas a guideline. But you know that represents best practice. And people who scientists who don't do that, that I would argue that they're not that is not the norm. That that is very much outside the norm. Thank you very much. If, uh, take the mic to in the centre there, and then we've got uh, Judith, and then I think we should give the panel the opportunity to respond. So, Carlos, just in the centre. Hi, um, I'm not going to talk about football, you'll be pleased to know, although I, I could because I am the secretary of the Elvington Harriers Association Football Club, um, just, to, just to display the range of my expertise there. Um, I wanted to talk about work. Um, and the labour of being a visibly good science communicator. Um, because it strikes me that um, just in the way that shop workers have to show empathy with their customers and um, air hostesses have to behave in particular ways and perform particular kinds of emotional labour, that scientists are also being asked to do that too in the way that they um, perform their work. And one of the things that strikes me about that is that um, there's a rather limited range of emotions that scientists are being asked to display. It's all got to be fun and exciting and they've got to put their heart into it and they've got to be terribly jolly. And I'd just like the panel to reflect if, if it might be more engaging and it might actually be more um, pleasant for scientists as well if they could display a wider kind of range of emotional labour in that work. Thank you very much. Judith, did you want to? Yeah? Just briefly, if you can, and then we'll um, yeah, give the panel opportunity to uh, wrap up or respond to whichever question. Yes, um, I have a question for Brady, and I just want to ask about when you uh, introduced your work about um, producing science videos, um, you, you say towards the end, um, I can tell whatever stories I want without having a boss who tells me what to do. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about your particular relation with the public out there for whom you produce these videos and what standards you apply in your own work, in your stories. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for the questions and sorry to cut off the time. Um, the panel, would um, Samantha, would you like to comment on any of those? Um, okay, we'll go for the persona one because I feel that's the only one I could possibly comment on. Okay, yes, we do go into schools and we do, we want to be happy in front of the kids, you know, we don't have to put them off and go in and say, oh yeah, look at us scientists, we're just really ground down by the work we do. Um, although a lot of time we are. Um, so it is a case of yes, especially like in front of the camera when we're working with Brady, you know, we do want to show our love for our subject and how happy we are that we're doing these amazing demonstrations and what have you. But a lot of the time, you know, if we're talking about something serious and yeah, you know when we're talking about the um, nuclear reactor in Japan, the meltdown, you know, it's a serious subject, we are going to portray our concern, we are going to show a range of emotions. There are a number of videos that Martin has done where he suffered a personal bereavement 
and he talks about that. And in a way, for him, it's therapy that he is talking to people on YouTube. These are people he's not, never met, never going to meet. Uh, it's a very personal video. And the great thing about being involved in a project like Brady's is that the scientists get to be who they are. They don't front, they don't pretend to be someone they're not. And they can celebrate their joys and display their sorrows in, in that YouTube channel. And Brady captures it all. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that certain, you know, programs on TV have to be a certain way, they have to present science in a certain way, you know, whether it's Bang Goes the Theory and everyone's madly, you know, ecstatically happy, or whether it is, you know, a nature program and you've got that kind of monologue where it's very kind of all factual. Um, but I guess that's the thing with social media, it's great that that's come in because it allows the scientists to be themselves. And as Brady said earlier, you know, when someone gets their grant proposal rejected, that's captured on video and people can see, oh my gosh, that person, blood, sweat and tears went into that proposal, it got rejected. No wonder sometimes scientists, you know, get really upset when their funding gets cut, because this is what they have to go through. And I guess, you know, with videos like that, um, hopefully more people watch it, more people can understand that scientists are human. And I guess that's why we've got X million number of views X many thousands of subscribers is because they get to see the whole deal rather than just the happy stuff. Thank you. Brady, we've got about a minute each. I'm on a yellow card here, aren't I? Yeah. So I didn't... <laughs> Actually, you just been sent off. <laughs> I consider my job being like a dating agency. And I think scientists and the public are going out on a date. And I think when you go out on a date with someone, you have a bunch of things that you want to say to them. You have an agenda. I want to tell them about this and this, and I want them to see me in this light. And when you go on that date and you go out to dinner and you have a choice, you can sit opposite the person and tell them all the things you want to tell them about yourself, or you can find out what they find interesting and what they want to know about you and what they want to talk about and start a conversation along those lines. And as the conversation unfolds, maybe you can drop in that Nobel Prize you won or that time you climbed Mount Everest. But if you sit down with a plan of all the things you want to achieve and say to the other person, and just have it all come out like verbal diarrhea, I don't think you're going to get a second date. I think what everyone needs to do is think about what the person on the other side of the table wants to know and wants to hear, and start a dialogue with them. And then over time, you build that relationship and you start achieving the things you want to achieve from engaging with the public. Too many people who contact me about doing new projects because they see the success of these other projects say, this is brilliant, I can do this, I can do that, I can tell people this, we can achieve this, we can tick that box, and they never even think about what the people watching the videos or what the people on the other side of the computer screen want from this relationship. And I think scientists do a lot of great things in the area of communication and engaging with the public but some of them don't spend enough time thinking about what the public wants. And you might think you're above that. You might think, well, I'm not selling out, I'm not compromising, but if there's no one watching, if there's no public on the other side, you're not engaging with the public anyway, you're just talking to yourself. Thanks, Brady. Richard, did you want to uh, final comment? Just a quick point on the emotion thing, which is it's a sort of slightly related point, but um, uh, last week I was uh, advising somebody at, physicist who was running a proposal, wanted to be a public engagement fellow, and uh, they'd written this uh, really reasonable proposal, I thought, you know, but it was evangelical, you know, I mean, it was about exoplanets, you know, exoplanets are the only thing that anybody really wants to know about, you know, that's the kind of tone of it. And I kind of said to him, okay, have you ever come across anybody who thought that exoplanet research wasn't the best thing, you know, since I went, oh yeah, 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 some people think it's pretty problematic, you know, we shouldn't be fun of it. I said, and how did you deal with it? And he came up with this kind of nice, kind of nuanced response for how he, how he dealt with it. And I tried to point out to them that this might be actually a useful piece of evidence to put into the proposal to suggest that he actually had a more rounded view of this whole process. I know it won't get in. I absolutely know in my half hearts he won't put it in. It's gone to a panel of his peers. It's gone to a panel of his peers. Why, why don't you think that? It won't just be a panel of his peers. Thanks. Thanks. Sujata. Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, I want to make a broader comment, just briefly going back to um, some of what Brigitte talked about this morning um, in the sense of uh, the, what do we mean by transparency? And she had this very nice analysis of different meanings uh, of the term. Um, and uh, just sort of reflecting on the fact that 
maybe in this panel, sometimes when we talk about uh, notions like openness or making visible, uh, there is perhaps an assumption that uh, there's something hidden uh, and that the idea is to make it visible, uh, which might then change people's behavior. You know, they wouldn't communicate by email or whatever. Um, and certainly that's one way to think about it. Uh, but it's certainly what a lot of science studies work has been trying to point out is when we talk about making science public, when we talk about talk, uh, the notions of public value, for example, uh, it's often reflecting on the stuff that's tacit, that's taken, taken for granted. Maybe things that people wouldn't even dream of hiding, you know, keeping secret, because it's just so much embedded uh, in the, you know, the ways of doing things. So I think that's something uh, quite important to maybe uh, keep in mind, that openness is not just about opening up something that's somehow uh, secret or uh, uh, hidden in, 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 a, in this kind of deliberate way, but actually um, opening up things which maybe are taken for granted. Thank you, and I'm really sorry to cut off um, what ended up being a really interesting debate. So if we could all thank the panel, particularly external people who visited us. Thank you. Um, and thanks for letting me be harsh.